welcome to the extended day, DC Day. Monday is where I go back to our old school style, and there's quite a bit uh, in the written DC Day and, you know, the normal categories we're going to cover. I'll walk through it for you who have gotten accustomed to listening to the podcast, watching the video. Uh, but the long and short of it is that it was a, a definite risk-off day in markets. The Dow ended up on the day down 483 points. 1.4%. The S&P, though, was down 1.8, and the NASDAQ down over 1.9. Pretty substantial give up. Um, you know, you could say, well, I guess that un unemployment report on Friday was too good, and then the market was panicking about the Fed tightening more. But, of course, that came out at 5.30 in the morning on Friday, and the market did drop 400 points in the futures market Friday morning. Um, it, it was the re It's funny. I was... Um, do, taping an interview for Maria Bartiromo's Wall Street Week on Friday morning before the market had opened, and then it's not going to air till Friday night. And we had just gotten the unemployment number, and the futures are down four or five hundred points. And she's interviewing me, and the tone of the questions is this thing where, like, when you're doing rare, not live TV, you you have to talk as if like there's an update, but then you know not box yourself in because of what could change by the time it airs. I think this is the only show I've ever done that isn't live. My my guys may correct me on that, but I mean I do this show, you know, four or five times a year, and we tape it Friday morning and it airs Friday night. I'm used to doing it. It's a great show, by the way. But anyways, um, it's weird when you're talking about something knowing it's going to air differently. Well, sure enough. The market closed up 40 points on Friday. And and um, then, uh, let's see, is that right? I believe it was 40, close enough, yeah. Um, that's right. And so um, my point being, I watch it Friday night, and all of a sudden the way in which is edited and the knobs are turned, you know, they do a very good job because... The, t the questions I was answering were in the context of being down 400, but they kind of got to rework the way it sounded as if that wasn't where they were going, and, and that's because of such a big shift. Why do I bring this up, and what's it have to do with today? My point is that I don't think the markets waited, you know, two whole trading days to respond to good employment numbers. Um, the markets initially responded with all of that trading arbitrage that had to be sorted through around expectations on the jobs number, it did drop a bunch. It then kind of recalibrated, actually rallied. Um, on the Dow side, went positive, S&P and negative, uh, NASDAQ slightly negative. And then now today, um, futures last night were only down 30 points or so. And then this morning when I woke up, they were down about 100. And then the market opened down about 175. And then we did get down at one point almost 600, you know, 580-ish, and we closed down 480-ish. So the markets were 100 points off their low. So, you know, it stands to reason that you get one of those days where uh, I wouldn't be attempting to canonize the explanation of market action today. One of the least plausible explanations would be a late reaction to a good jobs number. But you could say that was in tandem with other economic data that was strong or other whispers that the Fed is chilling on their, uh, their expectations for slowing uh, rate growth. I don't, know, I don't know what you want to do with that. Um, I think an equally plausible explanation is that this time of year seasonally that uh, annual tax loss selling is now a factor. Um, so there's any number of things that could play in. Um, when you go out longer term, though, and I want to get these numbers right, I'm looking at consensus expectations of $232 a share for the S&P for next year. And that's 7 to 8% lower than had been expected at the peak. We, uh, it was at one point priced in about $250 in consensus expectations. Um, but, you know, in 2022, the S&P is going to do about $221. So that means at 232, the market's expectations, these are an consensus um, expectations, are 5% higher than they were for this year. So, you know, do people believe a recession's coming? Obviously, the yield curve does. Do most people you talk to believe one's coming or has already come or is going to be here or what or is here now? And it could be minor, it could be not minor. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think so. But do earnings go up 5% in a recession? Not, not very often. So perhaps the belief is that the recession has already come and gone. Perhaps the belief is that we will have one. It will be very minor. And perhaps the belief is we'll have one, and it can do a lot of damage, but it just isn't going to chip into corporate profits. But, you know, I hear that more and more of like, no, 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 we're in a recession, and it's going to come worse, but it's not going to hit jobs much. And, I, and I'm trying to figure out what a recession is that doesn't hit jobs or profits. I, <laughs> I don't know what that is. Um, so perhaps... There's a whole lot of vocabulary stuff going on. God knows we're living through a time where a lot of words don't mean what they used to mean. Um, all right, so rest of the day today, uh, the, every sector was down. The best performing se sectors were defensive in nature, utilities, uh, healthcare, consumer staples all did the best, but they were still all nevertheless down. And then the worst was consumer discretionary, but right up there were other cyclical sectors like energy, industrials, financials. So. Uh, bad day for cyclicals, uh, slightly less bad day for defensives, okay? Uh, the 10-year bond yield moved up about uh, 10 ba 8 basis points to 3.58%, still really, really off of that uh, high of, you know, a month and, month and a half ago. Um, and on the news front, you know, the market um, was expected, I think, to respond a little more positively, but there's no question China is starting to slowly capitulate a bit on some of these COVID restrictions. Uh, more specifically, they had still had a mandatory COVID negative test required to use public transportation and um, a mandatory COVID negative test to go to a public park. And they got rid of that. So that's, a, that's an impressive level of status depression that they got people to stay out of the parks and the pu and the public transport system this long without without all that. Um, I, I, I don't keep a close eye on what exactly they'd been doing, but even I didn't know it was that bad still. So they got rid of that. Democratic Party is moving the first primary of the 2024 election out of Iowa, which it's been in, you know, as long as I can remember, the caucus there is going to go to South Carolina first. Um, and... You know, I'm going to move forward here. I think the two big public policy things I want to bring on, first, the easy one, the Supreme Court agreed to take the case on uh, President Biden's student loan erasure program. There was a lower court who kicked it out. It went up then to um, a federal court who uh, then now it's been appealed to the uh, Supreme Court, and they did uh, prove standing. And so if they're going to rule on it in February of 23, or excuse me, uh, hear, hear the case in June of 23, uh, uh, February of 23, we expect June of 23 when you get a hearing. And I don't want to give my own legal commentary, let alone my own political commentary, which I think you all know what it is. Um, but I, it's very hard to believe the Supreme Court will rule it to be constitutional um, based on the fact they were willing to take the case and based on what we know of the makeup of the court and the trickiness of some of the argument around it. Uh, but So I'm saying most people that I'm reading who do favor the uh, policy, and I do not favor it, but most people I know who do favor it are forecasting that the Supreme Court will not uphold it. And so if I say that, it may sound like I'm, you know, putting my finger on the scale of what I want and what I think, but that's that's not what I'm doing here. Congress is, I don't know, I think it's looking a little better in 50-50 that they will have a spending plan in place in the lame duck session, not have to go into the new Congress. There is a little debate between both parties on the amount uh, that would be in defense mandatory spending versus non-defense spending. Knobs still have to be turned to agreed to, but it does seem as if they're working towards an agreement on a spending plan going into 2023, and that takes away some of the risk about the funding of government next year. On the economic front, the jobs report Friday was the big news, 263,000 jobs. They're predicting 200,000. Wage growth was year over year, 5.1%. Um, and the leading sectors for that 263,000 in new jobs created last month was leisure and hospitality at about, I think, 88,000 jobs, where retail was negative on the month. So you continue to see this really lived out 
and uh, evident in the jobs data reality of services versus goods. Um, it's a mixed bag on the employment report. People that are so worried about it being a good report because of this paradoxical belief that what is good is bad when it comes to the Fed. Um, look, the labor participation force ticked up a couple uh, tenths of a point. The um, household survey was significantly negative. Again, 138,000 jobs, and that's including small business numbers that the um, BLS data does not include. So it was a positive report for sure, but it wasn't quite as heated when you factor in all the nuances, as, as some may say. So what kind of did heat things up a bit? Um, I think today's ISM services, seeing 56.5 in the ISM services index, it had been 54.5 last month. So you not only are way above 50, uh, indicating expansion, but you even got higher rate of expansion this month than last month. But you got that with lower breadth. Last month, I think we had 15 out of 18 industries in the private and the expansion side, and this month was only 13 of 18. There's a chart under housing and mortgage that I think says it all uh, about where price inflation is and way way it's being the the uh, way in which it's being measured. So the 75% uh, odds right now of a 50 basis point rate hike next week with the Fed. Uh, so that number's gone higher. Um, I don't see a lot of daylight where the Fed could surprise and, and raise three quarters of a point, but I wouldn't bet my you know life on it. But I, I think that's a, a pretty fair guess. And then the terminal rate, where they end up peaking and when they end up peaking, the Fed funds futures are now looking at a little bit better odds at 4.75% versus 5%, uh, but it's pretty close. And then when you factor in all, all of it, you know, it, that's around the range of where um, on the term structure people believe the Fed peaks and then starts to head down. And as I've said, I think the bigger issue that the data can't show now is how long they will end up staying at that level. So I wrote uh, about the Fed in Dividend Cafe Friday. I hope you'll you'll check that out if you haven't. Oil was up 3% this morning. It closed down 3%. You had OPEC Plus say they weren't changing supply levels. You had uh, the European Union announce they're banning shipments of Russian crude oil. Um, well, I would point out there's a chart in DC Today today that uh, I think I shared this factoid last week, but I want you to see it visually. 84% of the time in the last 22 years that the dollar was negative in a month, oil was positive. But both having the dollar and oil negative as they were in November is very rare. Um, so anyways, I'm going to leave it there. The Against Doomsdayism and the question of the day, you could read at the dctoday.com. But uh, it, there's a lot of action in the market today in energy. We have the Georgia Senate runoff tomorrow. I think most people are expecting for a number of kind of mathematical realities and electoral uh, sensibilities around what happened in the runoff and the general election with a Republican winning the governor by a wide margin, uh, and yet this Republican senator candidate still losing the race. Most people expect that the Democrats will firm up and finalize a 51-49 majority in the Senate after tomorrow night's special election. That's all I got for you today. Please reach out, though. Uh, we love your questions. Uh, there's a good one answered today in the DC Today about the yield curve and, and recessionary predictions. And uh, someone has already sent in one I'm tackling uh, in tomorrow's DC Today. But um, send them to us, and we'll, we'll try to get you published. And in the meantime, thanks for listening to and watching and reading the DC Today.